it's my, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, who's doing double duty. He's speaking as a plenary speaker in the Stickleback uh, Behavior and Evolution Conference has been going on, uh, that will be going on all week in this room. And he's also uh, a speaker in the uh, Provost uh, Lecture Series. Uh, this, so this audience today includes uh, participants in the Stickleback Conference from Europe, North America, and Asia, and also uh, people from around the campus, most of whom have just walked in. Uh, David M. Kingsley is a professor in the Department of Developmental Biology in the Stanford University School of Medicine and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Uh, he grew up in Iowa. Uh, he uh, was an undergraduate at Yale and earned his BS in biology in 1981. He earned his PhD at, uh, in biology at MIT in 1986 for research on somatic cell genetics of cholesterol metabolism under the supervision of Dr. Monty Krieger. Uh, from there, he moved to the National Cancer Institute in 1987, where he used classic and molecular genetic methods to study vertebrate developmental morphology in the mouse model. He joined the faculty in developmental biology at Stanford in 1991. Uh, recently, uh, the founding chair in the Department of Developmental Biology, Lucy Shapiro, described how she recruited David to the department. She was visiting NCI uh, in Frederick, Maryland to give a seminar, and she appeared unannounced in David's lab uh, to convince him to come to Stanford. Now, I should say this was not an entirely novel strategy because it happens that she had been recruited from Columbia University to head that department at Stanford uh, in exactly the same way. Um, after careful consideration, um, you know, earthquakes in California, tornadoes in Iowa, icy roads in Wisconsin, I guess maybe hurricanes in the southeast. Um, he fell for Lucy's pitch, and he had to settle for Stanford. Uh, David's lab at Stanford initially focused on genetic studies uh, of classic mouse skeletal mutations, with which he had great success. In 1998, he and his postdoc, Katie Peichel, began to use genetic mapping methods in the three-spine stickleback, using parents from highly divergent natural populations to investigate the molecular and developmental basis for evolution of vertebrate skeletal structure. His lab has continued work using both mouse and stickleback models, plus comparative genomics of humans and other mammals to understand the developmental genetic basis for morphological evolution in humans. For example, a few years ago, his lab uh, uh, identified a, a deletion mutation and resulting developmental changes that cause loss of sensory papillae in humans. This research made quite a splash in the popular press and seemed to be especially appealing to teenage boys. However, David's research has uh, been recognized in more critical circles. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005, received the uh, Society for Developmental Biology's prestigious Conklin Medal for uh, Distinguished uh, and Sustained Research in Developmental Biology in 2009. David was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2011. The title of his lecture is Fishing for the Secrets of Stickleback and Human Evolution. Well, thank you very much, Mike, uh, both for that introduction and also for all the work uh, put into organizing what's been a really interesting uh, meeting. I really enjoyed uh, this conference, and I look forward to the next few days as well. We all know that uh, animals differ in all sorts of interesting ways. I think the spectacular, interesting differences in natural species are probably part of what got uh, many people in the room interested in uh, biology. We'd like to understand a series of classic questions about what actually produces the interesting differences uh, that are found between wild organisms. So in particular, old classic problems like how many genetic changes are actually required to make the interesting traits that we see in wild species, what types of genes are involved, what types of mutations occur in those genes. And finally, if you give evolution some problem to solve, are there lots of different ways of doing it, or does uh, evolution tend to use particular mechanisms or even uh, uh, genes and mutations over and over again? 
Now, these are uh, old, hard problems. My own training, as Mike said, is as a geneticist. And what a geneticist would actually like to do to study those problems is to figure out some way to cross uh, different animals. So if you could cross uh, species that had very different traits, you could treat as a mapping problem where are the key chromosome regions and genes and mutations that make the difference. You obviously can't do that with the organisms here, but that's actually a very old idea in evolutionary biology. So Darwin himself uh, tried to use similar approaches. He looked for some organisms that could still be crossed but showed dramatic differences. He chose uh, pigeons and spent about 10 or 15 years joining various pigeon breeding clubs and setting up pigeon coops in his backyard and doing crosses between beaks and skulls of uh, different types. That didn't work well at all, so Darwin wasn't a great geneticist, and he was actually trying to do that work before the basic mechanisms of heredity uh, had been discovered. The last, not the last, the sixth International Stickleback Conference, the one in 2009, was actually held on the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. This year, we're holding the eighth International Stickleback Conference on the 150th anniversary of Mendel's first public presentations of the basic laws of uh, heredity done by crosses uh, between peas. And what I'll largely focus on today is trying to use methods of Mendel to uh, study interesting problems that uh, were originally raised and are often still debated uh, uh, from Darwin. When Mendel's laws were rediscovered around 1900, uh, biologists fanned out into different organisms to try to see if Mendel's laws were true in this organism, in this organism, in this organism. One of the mammalian uh, geneticists' favorite organisms was the laboratory mouse. I was just up at the Jackson Lab uh, last week, and it was really almost a century of work at the Jackson Lab that built a whole bunch of inbred strains and collected all sorts of morphological variants, tested Mendel's laws. And by the time I was a uh, postdoc, there was a beautiful linkage map that had been developed uh, for the various mouse chromosomes. I actually went through that linkage group as part of my job talk and put red dots over each of 150 different Mendelian genes that had been identified, uh, which controlled various aspects of uh, vertebrate skeletal morphology in these uh, mouse mutants. So what I had done as a postdoc was to pick particularly interesting red dots and try to use this classic genetics approach of crossing organisms that had different morphology, trying to find the chromosome region so that we could get down to the genes and the mutations. That approach uh, works. It took four or five years to walk down uh, mouse chromosome 9 and eventually get into the regions that were disrupted by uh, classical uh, mouse shorter mutation. What we found at the end of that uh, was actually uh, molecules called bone morphogenetic proteins that you just heard about in the last uh, couple of talks in this session. So these uh, secreted signaling molecules were originally given the name BMP because of a remarkable uh, biochemical activity. If you take bones from an adult animal, you can actually extract it and inject bone powder under the skin of a new animal. And the uh, bone extract has some magic ingredient that is capable of inducing the entire process of endochondral bone formation. So within a few days, you get cells aggregating around the implant, and then those cells differentiate into cartilage. They'll form a complete little bone filled with bone marrow that has the shape of the original implant. And what we found by studying our classical mouse mutations uh, was that molecules within this family uh, were the genes that were disrupted in uh, uh, classical mouse mutations, this shortier gene uh, had a defect in bone morphogenetic protein 5. When we did a whole bunch of additional work on what had happened in the mice that had long ears or short ears or a variety of other alleles, what we found was that these BMPs are surrounded by very large, complex uh, regulatory regions that cause the cartilage and bone inducing molecules to turn on in little specific puddles at different uh, positions in the body. So vertebrates actually use these BMPs much the same way biochemists had been, controlling when and where they're expressed in order to induce the formation of particular skeletal structures. Well, that sort of uh, work convinced us that um, genetics of morphology could work and take you to the heart of the developmental pathways that uh, were controlling the formation of particular structures. That was all done in laboratory mice, and in the 1990s, Katie Peichel and I got interested in whether we could use a very similar sort of genetic approach uh, now not uh, in lab mice, but in wild species in order to tackle the kinds of problems that I mentioned before. So in 1998, we actually had a very fun summer um, looking for some organisms uh, that would make it possible to take a genetic approach to studying uh, vertebrate evolution. 
So we wanted a whole series of criteria, so our shopping list said we wanted real species that had to have evolved under uh, natural conditions. We still wanted dramatic morphological and physiological changes, and of course some way of overcoming the reproductive barriers between forms. And then having done 10 years or so of mouse genetics, we were well aware of a whole series of practical considerations that's the difference between uh, how, how feasible this is actually going to be. One of the uh, key things that we found during this uh, summer was a book called Evolutionary Genetics of Fishes. I had checked out a library to read about one particular fish and actually took it on a summer meeting and I was flipping through the pages and found uh, a remarkable article uh, by Mike Bell laying out all of the beautiful biology and experimental and uh, interesting advantages of sticklebacks. It was a, a great chapter. It covered traits, the history of traits, the possible significance of traits, the evolutionary rates of traits, and it even had little convenient appendices about how to score them and sample them and collect them and stain them and score them and cross and raise them uh, in, in the laboratory. So uh, this was clearly exactly the sort of uh, thing that we were looking for, uh, and I'd actually like to publicly thank Mike uh, for being one of the ones who attracted us uh, to, to the system. I'd also like to point out, for any of you uh, who know Mike, you won't be surprised, his chapter was twice the length of any other chapter uh, in, in the evolutionary genetics of fishes, but he's been a very effective uh, evangelist, I think, for the whole field, and also um, has helped welcome and collaborate many uh, young people like ourselves uh, who got attracted to the field. Okay, so the great thing about these fish is tied to their uh, migratory life cycle. The ocean fish migrate into coastal areas in the uh, spring to breed. When the glaciers melted, those ancestral populations set up uh, literally tens of thousands of new populations in brand uh, new post-glacial environments. And in the last 10,000 years, or approximately 10,000 generations, uh, the fish have evolved really dramatic alterations in a whole series of morphological, physiological, uh, and uh, behavioral uh, uh, differences. The uh, changes in armor structures and feeding structures and color and other traits are as large as you would find between uh, different genera of animals. And yet, uh, these things have evolved so quickly in this particular group uh, that it is still possible to overcome the reproductive barriers uh, between forms uh, by artificial fertilization, for example, in the laboratory. That makes it possible to raise fertile F1 hybrids, uh, set up large genetic crosses, and treat uh, the evolutionary, the genetic basis of evolutionary traits as a standard genetics problem, where are the chromosomes, genes, and mutations that control the differences. When we first got interested in the fish, um, although they had great biology, they hadn't attracted lots of interest uh, from molecular geneticists. So in the 90s, uh, the fish were missing lots of the resources that you take for granted in a model organism. And I think as you've been able to see uh, in this meeting, uh, particularly and uh, other ones as well, over the last 15 years, I think the field has done a good job of trying to build a whole series of genetic and genomic resources uh, for three-spine sticklebacks, uh, including uh, uh, genetic methods for uh, transferring uh, genes around as, as well. So I'll try to show you um, how we've been using those sorts of tools to study a range of traits uh, within sticklebacks. One of the great things about this system, and one of the reasons NIH was willing to invest uh, in a genomic and genetic architecture, I think, for the fish, is because the very same tools can be used to study a whole range of different traits. So uh, once you've built this, uh, if you set up crosses, you can use a, a genetic approach to study all sorts of things. So let me uh, start with a trait that Mike Bell has also uh, been very interested in, which is uh, major limb modifications, which of course evolve all over the place in the biological world, including one of the most dramatic alterations of uh, limb formation, which is the complete absence of uh, hind limbs that's evolved both in whales and in manatees. Mike has analyzed the uh, evolution of pelvic reduction in a beautiful fossil record uh, that's uh, uh, available in Nevada. And also, uh, there's a couple of dozen living populations uh, in Alaska and other locations that have uh, also discarded uh, the, the hind limb. So that provides then a very rare opportunity for looking at what is the genetic architecture of a major change in vertebrate uh, limb patterning that's evolved under a full range of fitness constraints in the wild. And to study that, we collaborated with Dolph Schluter to cross a uh, marine fish with a Paxton Lake fish. So here's the pelvic apparatus of the marine ancestor completely missing in this uh, Paxton benthic population. It's a fish system, so you can raise very large clutches. 
uh, and from a 2500 uh, F2s, you can measure pelvic structures, isolate DNA, type them with a genome-wide set of linkage markers that we developed for this sort of approach, and try to find what chromosome regions are consistently uh, uh, correlated with uh, changes in pelvic structures. So when we did that, um, we found that this is not a Mendelian trait. There is no single chromosome where if you know the genotype there, you can explain uh, what the pelvis is going to look like. On the other hand, there is one chromosome region that explains about two-thirds of the variation that's seen in the F2 animals in that sort of cross, as well as several unlinked modifier genes that control 5 to 10 percent of the variance. So there's a major genetic effect, although it's not the only genetic effect. How about for other characters? Well, armor plate patterns are a dramatic example of skeletal differences between marine ancestors and freshwater forms. Cuvier originally gave different species names to marine and freshwater fish based on the dramatic differences in anterior-posterior patterning. And if you do the same experiment, set up a cross, uh, count plates, and look for uh, the chromosome regions that explain changes in uh, a plate number in the F2 animals, we get a very similar sort of genetic result, one major chromosome that controls over three-quarters of the variance in the trait, as well as several unlinked modifiers. We've also looked at some non-skeletal characters like pigmentation. As you've heard, uh, fish vary in color in different environments uh, around the world. You can cross dark ones and light ones, and Craig Miller found uh, that the pigmentation score in particular body regions was controlled by a major chromosome that uh, controls about 50 percent of the variance, as well as unlinked modifiers. So for plates and for pelvis and for pigment, if you actually do this sort of genetic experiment, we find a few large regions plus uh, multiple small regions controlling a lot of the kinds of traits that stickleback biologists uh, had been interested in uh, for many years. We've now used that approach uh, to look at a whole series of different characters in the fish, and uh, lots of traits have also been mapped by other groups as well. Here's a summary of a lot, uh, but not all, of the, the genetic data. There's a couple of nice papers that uh, uh, individually have huge numbers of QTLs because lots and lots of traits were uh, all scored at the same time using uh, the same methods. So if you uh, look at the uh, evolutionary chromosome region controlling feeding, armor, and bone size, and body shape, uh, you get this sort of pattern. There's a whole bunch of genes. They show some interesting clustering patterns uh, on uh, particular chromosomes. And although there are lots of genes, uh, the effect size ranges from quite small to quite large. So this uh, graph takes the individual chromosome regions controlling different traits and just uh, graphs the amount of the variance that's explained in the genetic cross uh, that was used to detect it. Uh, as I've said, there's uh, some big ones and lots of small ones. Uh, there are more small ones than big ones, but again, if you look at plates and pelvis and pigment, a typical architecture is that there's one or two chromosome regions that do a surprisingly large amount of the variance, and then lots of these uh, things that uh, have relatively small effects. Okay, so what, um, what do those uh, QTLs actually correspond to? We spent a lot of time trying to isolate uh, the uh, genes, and we focused on the biggest genes because they explain the most, and uh, technically they're the easiest uh, to deal with. So each of the major loci for plates and pelvis and pigment is now known. Uh, the major locus for pelvic reduction corresponds to a homeodomain transcription factor. So this is uh, a protein that binds to DNA and regulates the expression of a whole bunch of uh, other genes. PEDX1 uh, is known as a master regulator because it controls the formation uh, both of gene networks within the pituitary, and then it has this very striking expression pattern in developing limbs where it's present in the hind limb but not the forelimb of a whole series of animals all the way from uh, fish to chicks uh, to mice to humans. So uh, multiple uh, key roles. The armor plates gene uh, is a secreted signaling molecule called ectodysplasin. It got this name based on a human clinical phenotype called ectodermal dysplasia. Humans that have a defect in that gene are simultaneously missing their hair, their teeth, uh, and their sweat glands, all ectodermally derived structures. They also have some characteristic craniofacial alterations, and those bony changes in the skull are more obviously related to the armor bone sorts of traits uh, in stickleback. The mouse geneticist had also picked up uh, the signal and the receptor and the uh, intracellular adapter molecule that turns this signaling into patterns of uh, development of a variety of structures. Uh, these mouse mutants uh, correspond to the same genes that are also found in the, uh, the human clinic, and they all are things that affect hair and teeth formation. 
Finally, the pigmentation, uh, the major pigmentation QTL is a very well-known uh, gene, I would say one of the most famous uh, signaling molecules in mammalian development called kit ligand or stem cell factor signal. This key signal is expressed out in the body uh, in different tissues, so it puffs on uh, at the locations where pigment cells and germ cells and blood cells are going to migrate. All three of these key cell types have receptors uh, for the kit ligand gene, and their migration and proliferation and differentiation is controlled by the patterns of expression uh, of, of this factor. Again, uh, mutations in that gene uh, were known in laboratory mice that have defects in pigmentation and fertility uh, and, and um, blood cell development. Okay, so uh, those three major loci all clearly correspond to key developmental control genes. How about the QTLs with smaller effects? So um, these three are all things that were 50% or more of the variation. I think this is an area where progress is continuing, um, but just since the last uh, few stickleback meetings, uh, I think we can now identify uh, the genes that are controlling uh, some of the smaller QTLs. Uh, you just heard talks about uh, tooth number and BMP6. Uh, there's good evidence that um, MSX2 controls dorsal spine length and armor plate size uh, is controlled by GDF6. So what are these uh, new uh, smaller QTLs uh, uh, encoding? MSX2 is a homeodomain transcription factor, just like the PIDX1 gene that binds to and regulates a whole bunch of uh, other genes during normal development. And both the tooth number and the plate size uh, QTL uh, belong to uh, this bone morphogenetic protein family, gratifyingly exactly the same sort of gene that uh, we'd isolated many years ago trying to track down classic morphological uh, traits uh, in mice. Now, I think um, finding these key developmental control genes uh, for lots of the uh, QTLs uh, raises interesting uh, issues. So, as I've pointed out, all of them are known from mutations either in human disease clinics or uh, the mouse lab. And some of the phenotypes that you see in the mice and the human clinics are obviously related to what you see uh, in the wild stickleback populations. You knock out PIDX1, you get short hind limbs. These patients have dermal bone changes. Um, the uh, defects in the kit ligand gene cause uh, light pigmentation. On the other hand, all of these genes really are absolutely essential uh, developmental regulators, so they're required for the formation of lots of different tissues. And if you look at the other things uh, that are wrong with those animals, uh, it looks like a disaster. So if you had a mouse that was simultaneously uh, carrying the laboratory mutations in PIDX1 and EDA and kit ligand, it would be a bald, uh, toothless, white, sterile animal that died of craniofacial defects and almost complete absence of blood cells in the bone marrow. Uh, so obviously um, not a very promising looking basis for evolving uh, uh, wild uh, adaptive traits in natural populations. So I think that these results are interesting in light of old debates about the size of the genetic effects that actually underlie evolutionary change uh, in nature. Darwin actually had strong feelings about this that uh, he stated over and over again in The Origin. He knew about major gene mutations. He called them monsters, and they had been identified in both agricultural animals and in uh, human, human pedigrees. Uh, but he doubted whether uh, monsters would have anything to do with uh, the way things arise in nature because uh, natural species would never be able to make abrupt changes. Natural selection can act only by the preservation and accumulation of infinitesimally small inherited modifications, uh, each of which has to be uh, profitable. Exactly that same idea got uh, built into the uh, neo-Darwinian synthesis. So uh, more recently, uh, here's Russell Landy saying there are few, if any, genetically well-established cases of big mutations which have been fixed in natural populations. Mutations of large effect are almost uh, always deleterious. And finally, uh, the quotable Ernst Mayer. I think several of us have put up Ernst Mayer quotes because he's pithy and um, uh, they're always interesting. It's a general rule of which geneticists can give lots of examples that uh, drastic mutations uh, reduce fitness. To believe that drastic mutations will produce viable uh, new types out there in nature uh, is equivalent to believing in miracles. Right? So for a very long time, uh, evolutionary biology was quite skeptical about whether uh, big, big genetic effects would contribute uh, to adaptive evolution. And you can see exactly the kind of thing that uh, he's worried about here. Here's the mouse knockout of the, uh, the PIDX1 gene, and it has short hind limbs, but it uh, is missing its jaw, it has cleft palate, it dies at birth with craniofacial defect. 
Okay, so that raised the obvious question, what's actually happened in natural populations? Well, we can look at that in sticklebacks, and the PIDX1 gene, if you compare its sequence in marine and freshwater fish, there's no changes in the coding region. If you look at expression patterns in marine larvae, it's expressed in the head region and in this little spot along the side of the body where the pelvis will form in the lake populations, you still get the expression in the head, but you lose the expression at one particular place in the body. Right? So that looks like uh, a possible regulatory change. Unlike the mouse uh, labs who knocked out the coding region of PIDX1 and created mice that had simultaneous defects in everything that gene normally did, nature has preserved the coding region, it's preserved the information for expression in the head structures, it's just lost uh, the information for expression in uh, one particular place in the body. Well, that's a cartoon, and it's still short of the actual DNA bases that have changed in natural populations. And we've been very interested in trying to take these genes down to the next level to look at the DNA sequence variations, because that uh, would then allow us to ask a whole series of other interesting questions uh, about the origin and parallelism of uh, evolution in natural populations. And of course, the challenge is that uh, regulatory mutations are uh, very hard to find. So here's a uh, genome browser picture uh, from uh, the, the mouse genome of the region surrounding the PIDX1 gene, so the coding region of the gene here. There's 300,000 bases that surrounds the gene that uh, we think is chock full of regulatory information that controls where and when it's expressed. We can read from the primary sequence what the amino acids are, but we don't have a genetic code for regulatory information. So we can't simply inspect the DNA and say, well, that's a pituitary enhancer and that's a pelvic enhancer, et cetera. You have to find them experimentally. So uh, we've been doing that. Uh, you can use high resolution mapping in both lab crosses and natural populations to identify the key regions where if you know the genotype in this region, you can predict uh, whether a fish has a pelvis or not. If you then take those key uh, regions, so the, uh, for pelvic reduction, this maps upstream of the PIDX1 locus here, you can take a bunch of DNA fragments from that region, hook them up to GFP reporters, inject them into developing uh, stickleback uh, embryos, and try to find the little magic pieces of DNA that will correspond to uh, the information that causes expression at a very defined site in the body. So as you uh, heard from Abby earlier this week, the key genetic interval for pelvic reduction uh, contains uh, a regulatory switch that does drive expression specifically in uh, the developing pelvis. And if this is really the right gene and that's really the right information, we also should be able to do a more ambitious experiment and that's try to reverse the evolutionary change that's evolved in natural populations. So for this experiment, we take the uh, eggs from an evolved pelvicless stickleback and inject it not with a GFP reporter, but a construct where the marine control information has been hooked up to a PIDX1 cDNA. And we were thrilled to see that uh, when you reintroduce the marine regulatory information, uh, you can put the stickle back on the stickleback. So there's the restored uh, pelvis, vestigial apparatus in uh, the original population, and the introduction of this marine information puts a nice serrated spine on a, a restored uh, uh, pelvic structure in the transgenic fit. Okay, so we really do think this is the right thing, what's happened to it uh, in different populations. Again, one of the great things about the sticklebacks is that the same traits have evolved in lots of populations around the world. There's been uh, lots of interesting work using complementation and genetic mapping studies to show that independent populations from different locations around the world are using the same major chromosome region over and over again when pelvic reduction evolves. And when Frank isolated DNA from a whole series of different pelvic reduced populations and used to them to see what had happened around this pelvic enhancer region, what he found was that multiple independent pelvic reduced populations had small deletions of a few hundred to a few thousand bases that always overlapped this pelvic enhancer and would completely throw away the information for expression at this particular uh, site in the body. So uh, repeated evolution by repeated deletion of the same uh, regulatory information. I think that raises very interesting questions about why particular genes may be reused. Why is this trait evolving over and over again by uh, deleting uh, the same region? We pointed out in this paper that if you looked at the sequence of the pelvic enhancer and some of the junction sequences that were seen in deletions, there were some unusual features that resembled the kinds of things that have been found in fragile sites uh, in human chromosomes. These are regions of chromosomes that have a tendency uh, to break either in uh, karyotypes or in uh, human cancer samples, for example. 
So Kathy Jean, the lab, has done a whole series of beautiful follow-up experiments to test whether this PIDX1 region is actually fragile, uh, and it is by multiple criteria. So if uh, you put it into topoisomerase assays where you're supposed to get nice smooth circles for regular Watson Crick B form DNA, uh, you get unusual structures that suggest uh, this enhancer can form non-Watson Crick structures. You can also clone the region into yeast chromosomes, where it's very easy to see if a breakage has occurred because of the change in selectable markers on either side of the sequence, and you can count the breaks occurring just by counting uh, colonies on plates. So if you do that, uh, the uh, pelvic region breaks at orders of magnitude above background in yeast uh, fragility assays. Interestingly, the breakage rate actually depends upon a number of other features. It depends on the orientation of the element. It also depends on the proximity of that element uh, to DNA replication origin. So you can cure the fragility by either flipping it or putting it uh, in the right configuration uh, with an origin of replication. And finally, she's also tracked down the sequences within the pelvic uh, enhancer that uh, cause the fragility. You can recapitulate all of the behavior shown here uh, with clones that contain uh, the long alternating runs of purine and pyrimidines, a sequence that's known to form non-BDNA uh, structures. Finally, um, Kathy's been interested in trying uh, to use what we've learned about this region to try to measure the de novo mutation rate of uh, the PIDX1 deletions in the germline of uh, fish that start with two intact alleles. So now uh, we're, you can think of this as sort of an arrival of the fittest experiment where we're trying to see uh, at what rate do the uh, deletions that are selected in pelvic reduced uh, populations actually occur. So she's worked real hard to get very sensitive PCR assays that can detect single mutant molecules in uh, uh, PCR wells of, of sperm. And what she finds is that if you collect the sperm from a mouse that has two intact uh, PIDX1 alleles, one in 10,000 of the sperm will have a new enhancer deletion. So 10 to the minus four is the rate at which uh, the deletions are occurring, and that's about four orders of magnitude higher than the single base pair changes that are typically followed in uh, lots, of, uh, lots of genetic experiments. Finally, she's also been interested in whether those rates may actually vary among uh, different populations. So uh, she's been to Alaska collecting with Mike Bell and to the Haida Gwaii Islands collecting uh, with Tom Reimkin and is surveying by isolating uh, testes from lots of different individuals what is the breakage rate at the PIDX1 locus. And she does see uh, interesting variation in some of the populations. Uh, in particular, one of the ones that has a lower mutation rate is this population called L-shape that uh, Mike has characterized. That's a very interesting result to us because this is actually a pelvic-reduced population, but it's one of the few populations that we know of where if you set up the crosses to map the locus that controls pelvic reduction, it isn't the PIDX1 gene. Instead, it's using a major locus on uh, chromosome 4 instead of chromosome 7. It has an intact PIDX1 locus, but the intact PIDX1 locus breaks at a lower rate than it's seen in other populations, which suggests it's possible that the mutation rate may actually be influencing uh, the evolutionary outcome and whether you use this locus or a different locus. So we would uh, love to know the sorts of factors that change the rate. As I said, there's a series of intrinsic DNA factors. It's also possible that rate may be influenced by environmental factors. We'd like to know what the alternative pathways are to pelvic reduction, what other loci share the same fragility uh, features as uh, PIDX1, and whether we can use those sorts of signatures to try to identify other loci that may be contributing to adaptive evolution uh, because of similar uh, propensity to mutate. Okay, so this is really one of the first cases where we got all the way down uh, to the specific DNA base pairs that are controlling an, an interesting character, but I will say uh, the work's continuing on a whole series of the other genes that are emerging from QTL mapping. So uh, I just described uh, these few hundred to few thousand base pair uh, independent deletions occurring at the PEL-A locus in PIDX1. Abby Thompson uh, described yesterday that there's a second pelvic control region of the PIDX1 gene, and she's already identified uh, an interesting molecular lesion uh, in one of the pelvic reduced populations. It's also sort of a weird one. 125 bases have been lost, 344 base pairs have been inserted. The pelvic reduction, uh, uh, sorry, the pelvic expression goes down, new expression patterns uh, uh, arise. Earlier this year, uh, Natasha Brown from the lab uh, published a paper on a single base pair change that has occurred in a non-coding regulatory region of the ectodysplasin gene related to armor plate development. Uh, 
that single base pair change has a dramatic effect on the expression of the gene, specifically along the sides of the developing fish in the armor plates. It also changes uh, responsiveness to a well-known signaling pathway called uh, WINT. And very interestingly, exactly the same base pair change is seen in a whole series of different populations around the world. Not only the ones where we already knew they were sharing the same haplotype, but also an unusual Japanese population that was thought to be an independent example of low armor evolution. It has exactly the same uh, single base pair change. Other single base pair changes are now uh, being found. Tim Howes in uh, my lab has found a single base pair change that actually alters the splicing pattern of the MSX2 gene. You just heard nice uh, talks about the GDF, um, these BMP uh, fam family members. Uh, the one controlling tooth development, there's a clear enhancer. It's not yet clear what the base pair changes are, but clearly I think that will come soon. You'll hear later in the week uh, about an example uh, for the GDF6 gene, the other member of the BMP family. Vahan Injian did a nice uh, uh, QTL mapping experiment in the lab that tracked the genetics of armor plate size, big plates or small plates, not the number of plates, uh, to this member of the BMP family, and Garrett Kingman uh, will describe the molecular lesion that's again a regulatory change where uh, there's a whole bunch of single base pair changes, but there's also 1,300 new base pairs that's been uh, plunked into uh, the uh, altered enhancer of freshwater fish. And finally, you just heard uh, from Rhea that another possible alteration is um, the entire genes or intergenic regions uh, can be duplicated, an example of structural uh, abnormalities that change uh, DNA copy number. And again, we hear that same thing for uh, the Spigen gene, and everyone should stay to the last talk of the Stickleback meeting because I think uh, we'll hear another interesting example from uh, June Catano's lab uh, on Friday. Okay, so a variety of different uh, molecular changes. To me, it's interesting that there's really only a couple of them that are the kinds of single base pair changes that uh, we know the most about uh, DNA rates. And for the one that we've studied the most, there's very interesting things that are happening that are orders of magnitude higher and that we think may be influencing uh, the use of that gene uh, in uh, parallel evolution. Okay, so tons of different uh, QTLs, only uh, half a dozen of them or so, so far uh, converted into genes. But already, I think you can see from those initial examples some similar themes uh, that uh, are shared between many of the different traits. Uh, big phenotypic differences can map to a small number of loci. The major regions that control most of the variants turn out to be these key uh, developmental control genes. And although those genes play absolutely essential roles in the formation of lots of different tissues, uh, natural populations have frequently made regulatory changes that allow them to confine a major effect to a particular region uh, of the body. So you get a great big effect there, but you preserve uh, overall viability. And finally, and I think very interesting, for every one of these traits, uh, if you do the genetic mapping in lots of different uh, populations, frequently, not always, but very frequently, you find uh, the same chromosome regions being uh, used over and over again. And um, that's very gratifying to me, actually, because when we started this project, I had an interesting uh, discussion with a fellow faculty member in my lab uh, who said he thought the stickleback genetics thing uh, was stupid uh, for, for two different reasons. One, it was never going to work, right? We, we all know that evolution is controlled by lots of different genes, so you're never going to find anything if you actually try to uh, set up the mapping experiment. But then, you know, his real zinger was, two, even if you knock yourself out and do it, I don't care. And uh, the, the reason uh, he said he didn't care was because all we're going to do is track down the historical minutia of what had happened in a particular lake. If we did a different lake, we'd get a completely different set of answers, so there'd be absolutely uh, no gener generality. And we were really just kind of collecting butterflies or postage stamps. You know, it would be a lot of work, um, uh, but we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't learn much. And instead, what we actually find if we do uh, the genetics of particular characters, that the answers that we find very frequently explain what's happening in lots of different lakes and streams uh, around the world. So there are these very interesting uh, commonalities or almost predictability to the way evolution is going to work uh, in three-spine stickleback. Well, I think that raises interesting questions about how far the reuse of evolutionary uh, mechanisms might extend. We've been uh, very interested in that question, including trying to take results from fish and seeing if they could apply to other organisms, including, uh, including ourselves. So like sticklebacks, humans come in lots of interesting uh, different colors around the world. 
Craig Miller uh, found uh, when we identified kit uh, the kit ligand or stem cell factor gene as the major locus controlling skin color evolution in sticklebacks, that exactly the same gene shows one of the strongest signatures of molecular selection uh, in the human genome. That signature of selection was observed as modern humans arose in Africa, migrated into uh, northern environments, and lightened uh, their skin color. The regulatory regions around the kit ligand gene uh, actually explain about 10 or 20 percent of the variance in uh, mean melanin units between northern Europeans uh, and, and Africans. Shortly after uh, that work was completed, GWAS studies started to be done in lots of different uh, areas of, uh, around, around the world, trying to look at the uh, regions in the genome that are associated with a whole series of uh, traits in humans, including uh, morphological traits. So here's a nice uh, paper that came out on hair color, eye color, and skin color uh, in northern Europeans, uh, most of the work uh, done, done in Iceland. And this paper reported uh, that 350,000 bases upstream of the stem cell factor gene, there were markers that were very strongly associated uh, with blonde hair color uh, in Iceland. Well, we don't know the base pair changes that have uh, occurred in the stickleback uh, kit ligand gene, again, a, a major project to try to uh, track down uh, those, those specific DNA lesions. On the other hand, we thought uh, blondes in Iceland were at least as interesting as black and white sticklebacks in British Columbia, so we launched a uh, molecular project to try to identify the base pairs that might account for uh, this particular uh, human GWAS signal. So Kate Gunther in the lab cloned the entire uh, genome association region. The two flanking markers are no longer associated with blonde color. The peak of the association is seen here. She built DNA constructs over the whole region, hooked them up to laxi reporters, injected them not into sticklebacks but into fertilized mouse eggs. Uh, and when she did that, she found one particular piece of DNA that drives beautiful expression uh, in developing hair follicles. This was very striking to us because, of course, the association is blonde hair, and because the kit ligand stem cell factor gene is known to be expressed specifically uh, in the hair follicles, that's the signal that actually causes melanocytes to migrate, uh, set up residence, and uh, uh, differentiate to produce uh, human hair color. Well, what's happened to that hair follicle enhancer uh, in different populations? The study that Kate took the African version of the enhancer or the blondes in Iceland version of the enhancer and hooked it up to luciferase reporters and then looked at the expression pattern in cultured uh, human skin cells, keratinocytes. And what we found was that uh, there is a, a reduction, but it's a relatively modest reduction. So the uh, northern European form drives about 20% less expression than uh, the African form. There's only one base pair change that distinguishes uh, the two different populations uh, within the hair follicle enhancer. So we thought this was likely it, but um, didn't find this completely uh, convincing evidence. I think that uh, the best way to test whether uh, DNA base pair changes are responsible for organismal phenotypes is to put the DNA base pair changes uh, into an organism and see what happens. So, Kate hooked up the ancestral or the uh, blonde enhancer, not to a reporter gene, but the kit ligand cDNA, and then constructed two different lines of transgenic mice where the alternative uh, uh, types were integrated at a defined locus in the genome. Lots of transgenics are done with random integration where you don't uh, control copy number or where they went or what the orientation is. We thought for this uh, potential quantitative trait, uh, it was important to build mice that had a single copy of the gene in the same orientation at the same locus in the genome to control for all of those integration effects. So she was able to build those mice using a FICE integration system that was developed by Leach and Lowe's lab at Stanford. And when she compared kit ligand expression, now in the skin, the developing skin uh, of, uh, blonde, of the blonde line or the uh, African line, she again found about this 20% uh, reduction, lower expression driven by the uh, northern European form of the enhancer. The big difference was now we could also look at the mice. And you can just look at the mice and tell this one is lighter than that one. Right? So that single base pair change, although it's a small quantitative change, is a big enough change to produce a significant lightening of, of hair color. And so we think this is the molecular basis of uh, this genome-wide association study uh, reported here. <clears throat> 
Now, I think it's very interesting that uh, the molecular base of this human trait turns out to be tweaking uh, a hair follicle enhancer that's 350 kb away from uh, this key developmental control gene. One of the reasons that's interesting is you all know that hair color and eye color can be controlled independently, right? So we all know blonde people with different color eyes, or brown, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, if you look closely at this cover of the Nature uh, Genetics article, the different colors of hair and eyes uh, were done in Photoshop, right? So it's actually the very same person and they've just gone in um, and colored them uh, electronically. I would say we now see part of the genomic mechanisms that actually do that biologically. And the way you do it biologically is uh, surrounding the genes for these key developmental factors. You have local regulatory information that controls how much of the signal is coming over here without controlling how much of it's over there. That allows you to tweak the morphology uh, in different places in the body. Finally, although uh, pigmentation uh, and pelvic reduction are very different, um, I hope you can also see the similarities uh, between these two stories. In both cases, uh, we've got an, a key developmental uh, control gene that's required for the formation of a whole bunch of different tissues. And in both cases, the coding regions of the genes are surrounded by hundreds of thousands of base pairs of non-coding regulatory information that we think is chock full of little regulatory switches that control how much it's being expressed in different places. In both cases, we've been able to track down some of those specific uh, regulatory switches that control expression uh, specifically in the developing hind limb or specifically in the hair follicles. And in both cases, it's natural uh, changes in these tissue-specific regulatory elements that underlie the evolution of new skeletal morphology in the case of the sticklebacks uh, and new hair colors in the case of humans. Okay, so um, this so far has been a bunch of case histories when we started the stickleback project. Um, the eventual hope was there were so many traits that were different, so different in the fish that we'd be able to accumulate lots and lots of case histories. Each one might take five years or so, and if we got about 50 of them, then with only 250 uh, people years of effort, we'd be able to say something more general about um, the, uh, the fraction of the time that evolution works by some mechanism or uh, another mechanism. I'm happy to say it's actually gone faster than I thought it would, and it's because of the signals that uh, have been learned from the initial case histories. I mentioned that the genomic basis of repeated evolution of pelvic reduction is independent de novo mutations occurring on different haplotypes uh, in different pelvic reduced fish. In contrast, once we got down to the gene level for some of these other traits, we again found that they were being reused, but the mechanism of repeated evolution was different. For both the ETA gene and the kit ligand gene, what we found was the same gene was being used over and over again in different populations, but also it wasn't just the same gene, it was a particular variant of the gene, a particular haplotype that you would find over and over again, the very same sequence uh, in a whole series of freshwater populations uh, compared, to, compared to marine. And uh, we showed both uh, for EDA and for kit ligand that that occurs because these freshwater variants actually are out there in the ocean at low levels, so they're standing variants that marine fish can bring into new locations uh, that seed the evolution of uh, uh, new traits just by uh, selecting these pre-existing variants. So regardless of how common that is in uh, uh, different animals, it does provide one of the world's easiest signatures to look for uh, in comparative uh, genomic sequence data from uh, different populations because one of the other great things about these fish is that they are spinning out, uh, for example, marine freshwater forms over and over and over again in different uh, uh, locations around the world. So having seen what the ETA gene was doing, uh, we set out on a, a search for all of the regions in the genome that are identical in freshwater fish uh, compared to marine fish, or at least uh, show concerted, uh, concerted sequence changes that define a freshwater haplotype. So we collaborated with um, the Broad Institute to build a beautiful uh, reference genome for uh, three-spine sticklebacks and also to resequence a bunch of populations around the world. The strategy then is to window the genome, and uh, in lots of places in the genome you'll get a salt and pepper or a geographic relationship between the various populations. But if you slide this window along the genome, you can eventually find these locations where all the marine fish look one way and all the freshwater fish look another way, despite the fact that those are coming from uh, widely uh, different areas uh, around the world. So you can uh, make a numerical index of how similar are all the marine fish from, uh, how, uh, from the freshwater fish, and if you slide that along chromosomes, you get these peaks 
of uh, uh, sequence differentiation that are uh, being fixed repeatedly in stickleback. We knew that this approach was working when we looked at uh, chromosome 4 because one of the biggest peaks on this chromosome and in the genome is sitting right on top of the ETA gene, exactly the same chromosome region that we'd spent five years genetically mapping and positionally cloning in order to originally uh, identify this pattern. But you can also see, in addition to the signal around the ETA gene, which we already knew, there's a whole bunch of other peaks that are located in other places uh, around the genome. So in every one of these locations, freshwater fish around the world are switching uh, to an alternative haplotype compared uh, to, to marine ancestors. So uh, you can use different thresholds to define them. Uh, there, there's about 100 of these regions around the genome. The median size is pretty well defined because it's the shared region between lots of different populations that defines the area that uh, is being repeatedly fixed. So overall, it's a relatively small percentage of the genome, but we think it's a very interesting uh, set because it's like the ETA gene times about 100 more. Okay, so that then gives us a big enough set to begin to uh, ask some other interesting questions, including whether evolution occurs primarily by coding a regulatory change. And what we found when we analyzed what was happening in these different populations or different regions uh, from uh, the recurrent evolution of stickleback phenotypes is that a fraction of the adaptive regions do map to coding regions and show consistent amino acid differences between marine and freshwater fish. A whole bunch of the regions map entirely in between genes, so uh, are almost certainly regulatory. And then there's a series of adaptive uh, regions where the interval includes both uh, coding and non-coding regions, but the only consistent sequence changes that we see actually map to the non-coding regions rather than to coding regions, and so we think those are regulatory as well. I think it's very interesting to compare that pie chart with the pie charts that are also uh, now uh, possible to make from regions of the human genome that show evidence of selection. So now these are not being defined by repeated evolution, they're being defined by molecular signatures that a chromosome region uh, has recently risen to high frequency and produces differentiation between populations, cleans out uh, polymorphism, gives you extended haplotypes during a period of a selective sweep. There's been a whole bunch of genotyping and sequencing done in humans around the world. Lots of interesting papers trying to define these areas that show evidence of positive adaptive selection in different uh, human populations. And I've gone through a nice paper by Parta Sabeti and put them in the same uh, categories that I just described uh, for the stickleback loci. And I think what's really striking about the comparison between these two pie charts is they look uh, almost identical. So in both cases, a fraction of coding, the overwhelming majority appears uh, to be regulatory. And although these are very different scenarios, uh, the primary and important role of regulatory evolution um, shines out now in lots and lots of uh, different examples, and I think uh, that's going to be a, a general pattern that we can expect at least uh, for vertebrate evolution. Okay, which brings me to the last topic, and that's whether we've learned enough about uh, how stickleback uh, evolution is happening to begin tackling uh, even more ambitious uh, evolutionary problems. And one problem that we've been quite interested in um, is uh, the molecular basis of becoming human. Right, so a nice humble project like um, try, trying to identify uh, molecular events that underlie the distinctive traits uh, in, in our own species. So um, I know when I talk to people about this, they're, they're often skeptical, and there's lots of reasons to be skeptical. We obviously can't cross humans and other species. Uh, it's going to be a whole bunch of traits that are probably complex and controlled by lots of different genes. They took millions of years to evolve, and so they're probably based on an enormous number of uh, underlying mutations. Uh, on the other hand, some of those comments were exactly the comments we used to hear about how stickleback evolution was going to be impossible to study because evolution is really complicated. And what we've actually found is it is complicated. There's lots of regions involved, but some of them have big effects. So we've been uh, very interested in see if we could uh, find similar big effects for distinctive human traits. So how can we enrich uh, for big effects? Well, I'll make the case that deletions uh, are a good way to start. They're obviously a lot more dramatic uh, than single base pair changes. The direction of the effect is at least clear. You know what's happened. Um, this is gone. So uh, when you're trying to think about how it might work, knowing it isn't there is less ambiguous than uh, just seeing sequence changes. Finally, there's uh, theoretical predictions that losses may be one of the quickest ways uh, to adapt to new environments. And finally, this is exactly the kind of event uh, that we've actually found underlying major morphological evolution in sticklebacks, deletions of regulatory elements next to uh, key developmental control genes. 
So we decided to search the human genome for dramatic deletions of regulatory elements next to major developmental control genes. And the way we did this was to collaborate with Gil Bejarano's lab, essentially to do comparative genomics, lining up uh, the genome of our closest relative with uh, other primates all the way back down to mice, looking for non-coding sequence that is highly conserved from chimps to other primates all the way uh, to, to more distantly related mammals. And even though those sequences have been conserved for over 100 million years, they're surprisingly missing uh, from, from uh, the human genome. So if you do this computationally, you can find over 500 places where uh, humans have lost ancestral uh, information. Uh, they map to all the different autosomes. They're almost all non-coding uh, uh, regions, so they look like the kind of event that we see near the PIDX1 gene. And we've been having lots of fun trying to go through that list of 500 human uh, potential regulatory deletions to try to hook them up to unique anatomical traits that are uh, distinct in the human lineage. So we do that by um, taking the ancestral enhancer, which of course is still present in either chimps or mice, hooking them up to reporter genes, injecting uh, mouse embryos, and trying to see what is the specific anatomical pattern that's driven by this ancestral information. Is it at some site in the body that shows interesting uh, uh, evolutionary modification in the human lineage? So we've uh, now tested about 50 of the 500 elements. We've got some very interesting enhancers that we think are related to the evolution of unique genital morphology and pigmentation, uh, limb modification, so some elements specific to the hind limb uh, but not the forelimb that show very interesting changes in specific muscles and digits that have changed during the uh, transition to bipedalism, some craniofacial uh, enhancers, and then um, the last thing I'll talk about, which is uh, interesting enhancers related uh, to brains. So I think the signature feature of human evolution and the why we're in a room talking about uh, this, this, this kind of thing is because our brains are bigger uh, than uh, other animals. So humans have evolved this uh, increased intelligence that's based on a threefold expansion of uh, the cortex compared uh, to our closest relatives. Is it reasonable to think that the loss of DNA could actually contribute to the gain of tissue uh, in a structure like the developing brain? Well, I think it's at least possible. So um, there's genes that promote cell proliferation. There's also genes that inhibit cell proliferation. For example, many of you have probably heard of tumor suppressor genes that put the brakes on how much cells proliferate in uh, uh, different tissues. If you had a tumor suppressor gene that was uh, controlled by a regulatory element that uh, normally put the brakes on in a particular tissue and you threw away the brakes, then you could get an expansion in the corresponding uh, location. So that's what Alex Pollan did. He looked through the list of 500 human deletions trying to find those that map in regions uh, that were thought to be tumor uh, suppressors. And he found an interesting region on uh, 7Q22. And when he cloned the ancestral version of the chimp enhancer, what he found was it drove beautiful expression uh, in the developing uh, forebrain. If you section the transgenic mice, the expression is seen in these spindly blue columns. Those correspond to the radio glia that are the proliferating precursors that make the neurons that will uh, go out into the cortex. So MAPS in the tumor suppressor region and specific to brains, it's expressed uh, during normal neurogenesis uh, uh, in mouse development. This shows a time series, and you can see it's highly specific uh, to the developing brain. This corresponds to the time when these radioglia cells are dividing uh, to make the, the uh, neural precursors. Well, we thought that looked interesting, to, uh, interesting enough to try to see what it actually does. And again, I think the acid test for whether a piece of DNA has done something in an organism is to try to build an organism that uh, has that alteration. So we have reached into the mouse genome and deleted exactly the same ancestral enhancer that uh, was lost specifically uh, during uh, human evolution. And when we get those mice and transmit it through the germline, they are perfectly viable, uh, fertile animals. So I don't think that's surprising. These animals are now missing exactly the same piece of DNA that's missing in every uh, single, single person in, in this room. So there's no reason to think it's going to uh, be a deleterious event. It's actually fixed in uh, humans. What happens to the animals? Well, to look at that, Natasha uh, O'Brown has uh, done uh, genome-wide profiling of uh, RNA expression in the developing brain of uh, wild-type and enhancer knockout mice. 
Now we see hundreds of genes that uh, either go up or go down uh, in the enhancer knockout, so a, a quite large impact of just removing uh, the small uh, sequence. What are those genes? Well, the genes that are less expressed in the uh, developing brains of knockout mice are all things related uh, to neural differentiation. Here are the go-term enrichments that are seen for those hundreds of genes that go down in the mutant. How about the genes that go up in the, uh, the mutant? Those are all genes related to cell division and proliferation uh, and cell cycle. So um, uh, it looks like uh, removing this gene may actually stimulate cell proliferation exactly as we'd hoped. If you go in with in situ labeling and look at rates of dividing cells or proliferation markers like Chi-67 that uh, map cells uh, in, that are cycling, we actually see that proliferation rates are up by about 30% uh, in the brains of the enhancer knockout mice. The number of neural progenitors in the developing brains of these embryos uh, goes up as much as 50%, so a uh, dramatic effect on uh, uh, precursors. How about adult brain size and structure? Well, they're fully viable mice, so you can look at their brains. It turns out they have a thicker cortex, a 20% increase in neurons, a 35% uh, increase uh, in glia. So removing this specific uh, DNA is producing uh, extra cells uh, in the brain. And finally, um, are they smarter? Well, that's, that's a hard uh, question uh, to answer, but uh, being here at the Stickleback Conference, um, we had to figure out some way to do a, a swim test. So we uh, have put these animals into uh, the Morris water maze. And the way this works is you uh, have a great big circular tank and you put an animal in, um, the water is milky and they're uh, swimming to a hidden platform. So here's a wild type mouse trying to find this hidden platform. You train them for a series of days and generally uh, they work hard initially and then they eventually begin to learn uh, where the platform is. You can see surrounding the whole experimental setup there's a series of these visual cues, uh, triangles and circles along the walls uh, that help the animal uh, try, to, try to find uh, the location of the hidden platform and then remember where, where it was. So that's uh, the performance of a wild type mouse after a couple of days of, of training. Here's uh, the enhancer knockout. Same number of uh, days of training, and what we've seen in the enhancer knockouts is uh, that they're a whole lot better at finding uh, the, the hidden platform. So we've done this test now in uh, lots and lots of uh, different mice. You can plot the escape latency. How long does it take the mouse to find the hidden platform? Uh, they start at the same point, but the enhancer knockouts learn the task more quickly uh, than wild type. After you've trained them for three or four days, you can take the platform away and then ask after a period of time, do the mice remember where the platform uh, used to be? So this is called a probe test. And again, if you look at a whole bunch of the enhancer knockouts compared to wild types, when the platform is no longer there, the knockout mice will still spend a lot more time at that location looking for uh, the platform that, um, that used to be there. And then finally, after that, you can uh, put the platform at a new location in the tanks. So here's the initial training. Now um, you take the uh, platform away, put it someplace else, and ask, are the mice flexible enough to relearn uh, the location of a platform at a, a new position in the water maze? And the enhancer knockout mice, again, show improved performance uh, in the reversal task as well. OK, so uh, you can survey the genome of ourselves and our closest relatives and identify these interesting uh, molecular events that correspond to the type of regulatory alterations that we see in other uh, uh, examples of evolution in sticklebacks. You can reach into the mouse genome and knock out those same regions. Uh, so for a very specific brain enhancer, we get less neural differentiation. We get increased uh, uh, proliferation of cells. That actually increases the number of cells uh, in the developing forebrain. So we get viable fertile mice with more neurons, glia, thicker cortex, and they show uh, improved spatial learning and memory. Now, obviously, a 20 to 30 percent uh, increase in cells is just a tiny fraction of the 300 percent increase in cells that's occurred between uh, chimps and humans during human evolution. 
Nonetheless, I think it's remarkable to be able to put your hands on individual little stretches of regulatory DNA that actually recapitulate some of the most interesting traits that have evolved uh, partly, at least partly recapitulates, uh, some of the most interesting traits that have evolved in humans. And I think at the very least this shows uh, that the same kinds of mechanisms that we see uh, in sticklebacks have likely uh, controlled our own evolution as well. So I'll just uh, finish then by saying that I've tried to show you evolutionary change can be mapped and studied. Uh, we think there's very strong evidence that regulatory changes uh, in essential developmental control genes uh, actually underlie interesting traits that have evolved in natural species. And finally, I think the lessons that we've learned from initial case studies uh, can be applied to lots of other animals, uh, including ourselves. So um, I'd like to end by thanking a whole bunch of people. So uh, i got a whole bunch of names here, both past and uh, present members of the lab. We had a uh, reunion, the 25th uh, anniversary reunion of developmental biology, and so a rare occasion to bring back a whole series of people that have worked on mouse projects and uh, fish projects uh, in, in the lab. Katie Peichel uh, got everything started. Uh, I've talked a lot about uh, work that uh, many people have done. I'd like to highlight uh, Kathy G's work on the fragile regions and the Kitligan gene and Natasha Brown and Alex Pollan's work uh, on the brain enhancer evolution that I talked about at the end. So I'll end there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm actually not going to end there. I am, but I, um, there's a bunch of other names on these slides. And at the, particularly uh, at this conference, I would like to highlight um, the stickleback collaborators uh, that, that welcomed us into the field, including Dolph and Mike and Tom Reimkin. We've had great collaborations with all of them who helped uh, us get interested in the system and uh, have also collaborated on some of the interesting populations that we've studied. Now I'll stop. <laughs>